Hi, everybody. Uh, we are uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Um, we are very happy to have uh, Sean from uh, SACLE, uh, who will be uh, telling us about the CFT dual of, um, of a tidal force. And they, had, and, and, they, and they just had a paper this morning. So um, if you're on detail, just go on the archive and uh, the paper is there. So it was quite a bit of effort. Uh, we pushed um, the postdocs and the students to uh, finish the paper as soon as possible. And you know they did it. So you know quite a, quite a valiant uh, feat of um, physics. So finish the paper today. Anyway, Sean, uh, it's all yours. All right. Uh, thanks, Joseph. Uh, thanks, Nick, and all uh, the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you today. Um, I, so today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, some recent work that uh, I've been doing with uh, my collaborator, Ben, and also on uh, just a tad bit on the gravity side that I've been doing with uh, Ishwan and, and Nate, um, but mainly the, the CFT for today. And I want to uh, try to, we're, we're trying to understand what is the CFT dual of a tidal force? And I put a question mark because uh, there's still, uh, we still want to get a better understanding and hopefully there'll be some, maybe some ideas uh, from the audience about uh, further directions. But so let's just, uh, okay, get started. So a uh, uh, motivation. So um, as we've been talking about in this conference, uh, there's, uh, um, we've seen sort of a recurring theme um, talking about uh, microstate geometries and uh, uh, there's a special class called superstrata uh, and they've been shown to exhibit um, tidal stresses and, and uh, as David was talking about previously he, he discussed a little bit about this and Nick will more uh, um, later. Um, and uh, there was a calculation that was done where a string probe was sent into uh, the superstrata geometry, and it was shown to experience uh, tidal excitations along uh, the transverse directions. And because there's a, uh, at least at the free point, there's a, there's a well-defined uh, map between uh, the superstrata state, a class of superstrata states, and the D1, D5 CFT. Um, and th there's also been some computation done by uh, um, others, uh, uh, the looking at OTOCs uh, and BTZ and super uh, strata geometries. Um, so we want to understand this tidal force uh, from the perspective of the dual CFT. So how, how could we do that? So what, we want to have some diagnostic of this, um, something that may give us some hints as to is this, uh, is this uh, tidal force, uh, is, is this actually happening? Um, so one thing that we're going to need is we're going to need an interaction. So we're going to have to deform the CFT. Um, and another thing um, which the interaction will produce is we're gonna need to generate excitations. So when you think about the tidal force just um, uh, on the stream, the, uh, the, the kinetic energy is being redistributed amongst the, the modes um, of the stream. Uh, and so we, we want to get some sense of that in the CFT. So we're gonna need to sort of have a mechanism to generate some excitations. So we're gonna consider two scenarios. The first scenario actually we're going to consider is, is that we're going to look at the CFT dual of a probe in empty ADS um, with this deformation turned on. And then we're going to look at the CFT dual of a probe moving in a super strata geometry. And we're going to look at the differences. And as you'll see, uh, uh, there's, um, uh, there are some differences and this may help us to, to isolate uh, the tidal force. So let's just begin uh, with a very quick summary um, of the uh, two star solution. So you have, uh, you compactify 2B string theory. You have uh, this uh, 4 plus 1 uh, manifold here across a circle S1 across uh, T4, and this is where the CFT will live. And so you wrap uh, N1, D1 brains around the S1 and N5, D5 brains around T4 across S1. And then, of course, uh, they share this common S1 direction. And this fully uh, back reactive solution is the, is the super tube. Uh, wow, it's been about two decades ago. Um, uh, so much progress has been made uh, since then. That's why we're all here. Um, and uh, so there's a particular limit of this geometry, which is uh, ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. And so here's just sort of a schematic picture of uh, if, if the D5 brains sort of cover this whole space, uh, the D1 brains cover the circle. And so they coincide just uh, on the S1. Uh, and so uh, the, the free city, David gave a great uh, um, introduction to this previously. I, I would just uh, 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 say a few uh, points here. Um, the, the, free, the CFT is a bound state of these D1 and D5 brains, and they wrap this circle. And so uh, the circle we're going to take to be a rescaled version of, of the physical Y coordinate. 
and um, and the brains wrap uh, this circle here, and it includes a time a time uh, time direction tau, which is a rescale of uh, the 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 physical time rescaled, and then it's uh, uh, wick rotated, and so the base space is given just by a cylinder, and it's described by this coordinate w here, uh, tau plus i sigma. Um, and so uh, the, the, the CFT also, uh, it has uh, excitations. And so you can have excitations of the D brains, uh, which are these sort of open string excitations that, that carry uh, polarizations along uh, the T4. Uh, so the bosons are polarized along the T4. And there are four fermions, which carry actually a T4 index and also a, 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 a three sphere, S3 uh, charge. Um, and so you can have uh, left and, and, and right movers. Um, and so, and there's a nice relationship between this, between this CFT and the gravity dual. So um, what we really need to do though, is we need to move away from the orbifold point um, and to approach the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the supergravity, to move closer to the supergravity description. And so what we do in the CFT is we, inter we introduce an interaction or, or a deformation of the theory. And so schematically it's this, you know, here. So you have uh, the free action plus uh, some deformation. And we're gonna be computing, our computations will be in small lambda, um, um, and, uh, which allows us to actually compute things. So what is this deformation? Uh, it contains uh, two main ingredients. The first is this supercharge operator. This is a super, symmetric uh, 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 CFT. And so it contains uh, the supercharge, we call it a supercharge G and uh, the bars, the note right moving and the, un uh, the unbarred notation is left moving. And so you also have uh, uh, this sigma here, which is a twist operator. So what does G do? Uh, uh, put simply G uh, can take a, a fermion, a bosonic excitation and give you a fermionic one and vice versa it can take a fermionic excitation and give you a bosonic one. And here alpha is, uh, stands for boson and D stands for fermion. C so sigma, what does sigma do? It's the twist operator. And what it does is it twists and it untwists the effective strings which are wrapping the circle. And if you think about um, you know, what, what could happen, how could they interact? Uh, this is sort of, the, sort of the basic interaction that you could think of in your mind is, hey, if I have two strings, what could I do? I could join them together. Um, and so what we want to, uh, to look at uh, in this talk is actually we want to look at second order in the deformation operator. And the reason that we're looking at second order is because um, we want to try to, to uh, create a scenario where uh, sort of the background is fixed approximately. We know that when you're actually twisting and untwisting these, uh, these effective strings, you, you're, you are changing the background in a sense, but you want to you want to limit that. And so we use two because we can we can begin and we can end in the same twist sector. And so and this is sort of the simplest way you can begin and end in the same twist sector. You just you twist two guys together with one sigma and then um, just I'm just uh, showing the sigma part and then you can untwist them back into two guys. And so um, this is going to be our uh, mechanism uh, for generating uh, uh, the excitations. Um, okay, so a graviton probe. So let's first consider a graviton probe moving in the two charge system. Um, and and th there's a particular twist sector in which the this two charge system is actually uh, sort of global uh, ADS. And that's when uh, that's the NS sector, and you you, you can have um, all the uh, you have all singly wound uh, uh, vacuum, uh, in its vacuum. And so if you just wanted to schematically, if you wanted to think of a probe moving in this ge geometry, what you would do is that um, in the CFT, that's, that's sort of dual to an, an, alpha, an alpha bar excitation. So this alpha generates a left mover uh, with, in, uh, with energy uh, N, mode number N, and it generates a right mover also with mode number N. And so uh, this is sort of how you can, can construct uh, the, the CFT dual of, 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 a single, of a single scalar moving in an ADS. Um, and so, so this is what we want to look at. And, and, and so when, 
what what can happen is if when you start with uh, a single left and right mover, um, you can twist this together. You you can you can uh, apply two of these deformations, and you can and you can consider the simplest sort of splitting scenario. We call this splitting because we're trying to generate uh, more excitations um, because we we think that this may be a signal of uh, of this tidal force, um, and so. Uh, the simplest uh, amplitude is if, if you go from one to three. So one left mover, three left movers, one right mover to three right movers. And here, this is- Sean, second. Yes. One second. One, one goes to two doesn't happen because- um, Because you have the supercharge, I think you um, the supercharge offers two modes. And I think to get a non-zero amplitude, I think you need one to three. Because it, it basically comes down to when you start with, when you're performing these contractions, you need uh, you need an even number of uh, bosons and fermions. Okay. Um, yeah. And so. Um, okay. So here is just a, a restatement of what I said, just uh, in terms of the cylinder. So here, we're starting at um, at early times. We have uh, let's say we have a left and a right mover acting on uh, on the vacuum and we apply two of these d operators and and we're going to just for example we're going to just twist the first two guys together and then we're going to apply another d and then we're going to um and it's going to untwist and then it's um, a possible final state is three excitations but this isn't the only thing and and you can kind of see you you can you actually get a tower of excitations because um, you, we, we can borrow the intuition from, from quantum fields and curved space. Anytime you sort of dynamically change the vacuum, you can you generate um, a particle creation. And so actually this state is much more complicated than just this, uh, uh, than this simple uh, state here, but this is one final state that you can consider. But it's not the only one. There's actually there's uh, pretty much an I guess an infinite number of terms you could consider. But um, this is sort of the simp the simplest. If you wanted to consider a splitting, this is the simplest final state. I guess one of the simplest you could consider. Okay. Can I ask another stupid question. If you start with the vacuum, though, there's no the amplitude to produce two particles is presumably zero. There's some super selection rule or something. Uh, I think, oh yeah, I think if you actually apply the G, I think if you actually apply the G, it might be zero. Mm. Yeah. I have to think about that, but I think, I want to say if you apply the G, then that might, then that might actually be the case, but. I suspect the vac it's vacuum to vacuum, so. It does require you put a seed in to make this creation go, I think, but I'm not sure of that. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, th I think so. Um, mm, I'll have to, th let me think about it. Uh, okay. So, um, what types of things would we like to compute here? So, uh, we'd really just, we want to compute an amplitude, which basically describes uh, the probability that this one mode could go into three modes. And so this is sort of the amplitudes that we consider here. So you have your, your initial states, psi one, and you, have, you apply two Ds, and then you have the phi one, the final state. And so we want to compute so this is a transition amplitude, and we have to integrate over the positions of the twist. And so we integrate from zero to two pi with sigma, and then we consider some region of time um, uh, that we integrate over. And if we do this for this one to three process, uh, we, inf we enforce this energy conservation. And we can also consider various splitting scenarios. But in this case, we're just going to consider the simple, uh, the, the the sort of equal partition, so an equal splitting behavior. Um, and this is what we find. We actually find that the amplitude, it oscillates 
uh, with time. Um, so in some sense, this is kind of what you would have expected because the, the, the probe is moving in the geometry, but there's, it's just ADS. And so you would expect some type of sort of periodic behavior. Um, and so we analyzed this amplitude in detail. Um, and actually there's a sim, you get a similar sort of, you get a similar form if you consider also alpha to an alpha and a D and a D. Um, and, but, but you don't see any significant sort of growth uh, for a long time scales. And actually further analysis shows that um, as you, you compute these amplitudes, you can, you can find that um, there's a linear growth from zero to pi, and then that same linear decay from uh, pi to two pi. And so from zero to two pi, uh, you see sort of this periodic uh, behavior. And another thing here is that um, this amplitude grows with time and so uh, just uh, one power of time. And so it, this kind of, uh, it, this sort of shows that this, the twist has formed into sort of a local operator or a bound state um, 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 through this, uh, this linear uh, time dependence. And it's also a function, it goes like one upon uh, the energy squared. So if you analyze these coefficients, this is the behavior that you find here. Um, and this is a plot of uh, this amplitude A here for various uh, uh, initial energies. And remember, we're looking at the splitting, equal splitting. So for example, if N is 18, then the final modes will have uh, will, will, will be equally shared with uh, six units of energy um, and similar, so on and so forth for these guys. And so um, this, uh, so, so here's a, this is shows sort of the periodic nature of the of the one to three process in the vacuum, and you know, and, and this is kind of what we would expect actually. And so one can actually extrapolate to or, or compute a large n result if you consider that the, the the left and the right movers stay on the same string. Then um, if you if you start uh, if you start the left and right mover on a string, then you can you can twist to any of the n minus one strings. And then twist back, uh, uh, leaving it everything on the singly wound string, and so you get this enhancement of a factor of n, and so the n and this lambda squared it combines to give uh, this g squared, and this is kind of like this is like the Tooth coupling here, um, and so but if you consider that the left and the right movers are not on the same copy, then you don't get this enhancement factor. And so if you sum over the final states, when, they, when the left and the right movers aren't on the same copy, then uh, this only brings in one factor of n roughly. And we see that this amplitude is much, much less than if the, the excitations are on the same, uh, stay on the same string. And so what this shows is that there's a preference uh, that the left and right movers, they want to stay uh, on the same string. It, it, and this is a, this is this idea, kind of a similar idea of, of like a Bose enhancement uh, factor. Um, okay, so so far what we've done is computed the one to three splitting, uh, and which corresponds to this uh, particle moving in this ADS, and we find a periodic behavior, which uh, is expected because the particle will go in, and it will come out the other side, and then it will come back down and it will return back to its uh, starting point. And so in some sense, this is what uh, we expect. And so we see, a, and so we see a, a correspondence between nothing happening in the bulk and this periodic behavior. So now um, what we want to do is, what is the CFT dual of a superstrata? We wanna look at this a similar process in, in, in the background of a superstrata geometry. And so, um, as has been explained uh, before, uh, the superstrata is, uh, it's, it, you take the, a momentum wave along the two charge solution and you fully back react it. And uh, you get this, uh, three, uh, this uh, smooth three charge solution called a superstrata. And for our, for our purposes, we're gonna consider a, a, a very uh, simple sort of class, a very useful class of superstrata called the, the one zero N. That's the, the CFT states we're gonna look at, which correspond 
to the one zero in case. Uh, and uh, and I also note that that these solutions they're controlled by two parameters A and B. A uh, is related to the angular momentum on the S three, and B is related to uh, the the uh, linear uh, the moment the, the the momentum along the y circle. And so uh, this is what we want to look at. Uh, we want to take a probe. We want to look at the CFT dual of this probe here, as it travels in the superstrata geometry. And in and, and, and the uh, in in the in the gravity computation of the probe, um, um, they the authors uh, Nick and Emil they considered uh, a special direction along theta uh, equal to zero. And what was found was that there was tidal excitations along the y circle and along S three. And so um, we want to. So now we want to investigate the dual of this process in a simple scenario. And so this is pictorially what we want to consider now, a left and right mover on, uh, along with a, a, a left moving momentum wave generated by the superstrata. And so um, what does that look like? So uh, we, like I said, we would consider sort of this very simple uh, 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 superstrata state. Uh, the momentum wave is generated by this L minus J here. Uh, to the power of n, and um, the, the and these uh, zero, these are zero zero uh, uh, wound strings, and so there's no net momentum along the S three, and there's a, there's n zero zero of them, and uh, the other part is the plus plus part. This is where the angular momentum comes from along the S three in the solution, and uh, there's n plus plus of these guys, and so we're con uh, we're considering. Uh, one here means that the, the the winding here is one, and so the total number of strings is n one n five is is n zero plus uh, n plus plus here. Okay, this is the superstrata state. Now we want to consider um, a probe moving in this moving. Uh, uh, so in the gravity, we want a probe that's moving in the gravity. What is the dual of that? We have the superstrata state, and then we put a probe and an alpha alpha bar excitation. And actually it turns out that uh, the simplest sort of case to do this is to put the alpha alpha bar on the, the vacuum of the plus plus strands. Um, you, you can put it on this, it's more complicated, but I don't think the results, we actually tried that at first and it was, uh, it, it was even more complicated. And so we, so we kind of looked at this scenario, but I don't think it will change much. Like if you put this on here, the, I don't think the overarching idea will change much. And in the 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 in the superstrata uh, geometry, the the long throat re region is given when uh, when b squared is much much greater than a squared, or the n zero zero is much much greater than n plus plus. Okay. Now, so we 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 go through this process again, uh, but now we we twit we're now twisting an l minus j. With an alpha, with with two alphas, an alpha, well, an alpha and an alpha bar, and so we designate sort of two strings, uh, this one and this one, and we twist and untwist the state, and we want to look at a final state that looks like this, and let me just explain a little bit here. So we've kept because we want to, uh, we don't really want to study back reaction in this in this picture. We want to keep the background fixed as much as we can. So we consider that the superstrata goes back to itself, but we want to look at maybe the spread of these excitations on top of this. And so we want to say, okay, what uh, can we can we uh, compute a, a one to three process on top of uh, the the superstrata state? Um, and furthermore, because of the excitations were along the S3 the, in, in the gravity computation, the, the tidal forces were shown to be excited, of the string was shown to be excited along the S3. And so the simplest thing that you could think of maybe is, is how do I look at stuff on S3? Well, I need some S3 charge. And so I add, uh, a, 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 I, add uh, I wanna look at fermionic modes in the final state. Um, now, you know, there's a, there's a question about what are the, uh, and I was talking to Ben about this, uh, what are actually the stringy degrees of freedom? And, and I think that's, that's actually kind of tough to precisely identify. 
in the CFT. And if anybody has any uh, suggestions on that, I, I would love to hear. But the, the simplest thing that, that one could just write down and say, hey, let me just look at that, the, the probability to split into uh, uh, fermionic degrees of freedom. And so we, we go through again and we compute uh, a, a, a splitting amplitude. And uh, so we have our initial state and our final state and the two Ds here. And we run through the similar process. And now M, M is the energy of the probe or, or, or 2M is the energy of the full probe. Uh, one uh, uh, M itself is the energy of a left to right mover. And so we again consider, we, we have energy conservation. We again consider this, equi this equal splitting. And we find this. Um, we actually find a sim very similar oscillatory term. Um, some slight differences, but, it, but, it's period but this is periodic. But now we find a growth this T squared growth here. And, and it's this growth that sort of signals that something is, is happening there. there. There's a growth in this sort of splitting into these modes, um, which could resemble the, the idea of a tidal force. Because see, the, 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 the periodic nature in the gravity, it, it sort of represented the fact that the particle could go in and come out or go in and come back to the boundary. But the fact that it's not periodic is somehow saying that the particle is going in and it's not coming back out. Um, but it's made, you know, and, and I think in, in their calculation in the gravity, they showed that the stream that it goes in and, and it, it, the return height is less and, and less as it oscillates back and forth in the throat. And so, um, and so this is what uh, the amplitude actually looks like. Uh, because you combine this oscillatory behavior with the T squared, um, you get sort of this, uh, this, this behavior here. It, you can see sort of an overall T squared growth, but there's like a, it grows here and then it goes up here and then it goes up here. And, and it's, it's also, it, it falls like one over M squared. And this, this here can be approximated by, it, it, uh, this here is very close to this sort of, uh, it's like a, it's like a saw-like behavior from zero to pi. Um, um, and so, so let's compare the two processes. Um, and don't, if, don't worry about the, this minus sign. I, um, it came out of the computation, but these are amplitudes. And really what you do is you want to square them, uh, take the mod squared. And so uh, we can absorb this minus sign. It's, it's not so, so important. Um, Sure, well, I have a stupid question about the yeah, sure, previous slide. Um, look piecewise linear. Well, can you go back to the previous slide? Why does it look piecewise linear? Is that something I should? Um, no, that's a good question. I think it's it. Uh, yeah, it's it's sort of the behavior. It, it's the the amplitudes um, when you when you actually sum them, you sort of get this uh, this, this piecewise linear. And I was trying to think about this. Uh, I still want to think about this more exactly, but at least from the first part, you, from the first, from the first uh, sort of periodic uh, motion of the, you see this sort of cancellation of the t squared term here. If I consider from zero to pi, and so and so, you, it, it's very similar to the to the one to three splitting in the vacuum at first, and so you see this, uh, but the the t squared behavior is causing it to grow, but then it's also piecewise linear. Um, I I I want to I want to investigate more as to this uh, why it's like piecewise linear here, but it is it is an interesting sort of phenomena. Um, how um, and it's quite it's quite amazing that the 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 number of terms that uh, s sort of add up to give you this behavior, um, and the fact that it cancels for in the first zero to pi. You see a cancellation here um, with uh, this t squared term in the first zero to pi region, and then it's linear, and then it, and then it gives you basically the linear behavior that you would have gotten from the one to three process. So somehow it's saying at early times it looks similar, but then as time as as time goes on, it the, it, it it forgets about that and then it begins to grow. Um, so. Sean, can I ask a question here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in the vacuum situation, I suppose 
the expression you get is valid for OT. Uh, are there, is this expression that you get here valid for all time or is there any limit on when you're, when yeah, I think there works? is a limit. Um, so this lambda squared here is, uh, okay, so if you do the full n computation, you get a factor of n, but then there's a question of like, when is this, so this is all perturbative. And the question is, uh, when is this uh, becoming valid? So I guess once t becomes, it's like of order lambda or one over lambda or one over um, the n times the lambda squared, the t squared is like one over n times lambda squared. I think then the, you probably can't trust it anymore. Um, but at least in the perturbative regime, it, it gives some hint as to what's going on in the gravity. That's kind of the, uh, I guess, one of the, one of the drawbacks is this is a perturbative calculation. Um, you know, how, you know, how much can we extrapolate it to the strong coupling region? Um, that's, that's something that we're thinking about, but, um, yeah, I think when, uh, when it reaches this sort of scale here, I think it's, yeah, that you could probably stop trusting it. And on the plots, that would be, um, ah, that's a, yes. So in this plot, we've taken, okay. I, in this plot, we've taken Lambda equal to one, but I think we've always assumed that we're in the perturbative regime. So it's not on this plot. I didn't show it, but I, um, a more detailed analysis, I guess we, we, we would show that. But here in this okay, plot, we've just you. taken, yeah, Lambda equal to one. And we are just was trying to show the behavior, but you're right. At some point it will break down. Uh, yeah. Um, Excuse me, can, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, how does the parameters A and B enter in this? Ah, so good question. Um, so for this, for, so for this particular uh, computation here, we've they, we've only considered like a um, I guess n n zero zero is one and n plus plus is one. Um, so we haven't used the fact, not in this particular amplitude here, we haven't used the large n limit yet. Um, so I guess you okay. can imagine, I, you know, if I started with, let's say I started with n, one n plus plus, and I had, you know, n zero, n zero zero singly wound guys. And if I wanted to look at the fact, um, if I wanted to sort of have this Bose enhancement factor, I would expect the n zero zero to come in. Um, in that case. And okay, so can, you, can you guess how exactly it, en it enters and how, okay, so you said that this is going, this per perturbative expansion breaks down, but maybe the time at which this breaks down depends on B and B is real, or well, maybe also on A. A and B are related to the depth of the um, throw. So maybe it's really at the time when you hit that, this um, point where the um, tidal force is big, when this perturbative expansion breaks down. Of course, this is uh, this is a perturbative thing. So I don't know if you can say. Yeah, no, that's a good that's much. a good point actually. Um, I no, I, ha I haven't uh, thought too much about it, about it in that in that depth. I, I'm definitely thank you. I definitely want to think about that more. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that would, yeah, that would be interesting. Because the thing is, the okay, so. Uh, I, we were talking to uh, Joseph and Nick about it, about what is the sector that you want to actually look at. And in this computation, everything has been computed in the singly wound sector. So, so in a sense, you're going to get this sort of Bose enhancement term um, if you consider that the, that the, that you can keep, if you consider the scenario that you twist back to the same stream, you, you know, you can sort of use this Bose enhancement. And I could imagine that because we're on a singly wound, there's an N0, zero, zero. This would come with a factor of N0, zero, zero. But one mm -hmm. could, in principle, start off in a long winding sector and do this same process. And maybe you would get some one over, uh, some one over factor, I don't know. Or, um, and it's, yes, uh, uh, we, we've thought about maybe doing it it's the thing is it's in the in the one one in the singly wound sector. This computation is actually uh, is doable. Um, it seems quite difficult. Uh, at least maybe there's some approximations we can make to try to look at the long winding sector. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think the belief is that actually that's the sector that that all the zero zero strings should actually join up into 
um, long plus plus streams. And so I think it would be interesting to look at that sector. And then that, that may bring in some different behavior into as far as what you're um, asking about when does this break down and things like that. I think that'd be very interesting to look at though. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so, uh, so <clears throat> looking forward, um, this is a very naive picture too, but looking forward, since we showed there are some T squared growth in this process here where we're generating these fermionic modes, which, uh, which, which may be related to actually uh, stringy modes along the, the, the three sphere. It, it seems likely, I mean, it's very likely that the same process should, that we should still get the same growth for if we just uh, uh, look at transitions to the, the bosonic sector, which carry uh, the T4 indices. Um, but as I was saying, I'm not quite, I'm not really sure how to precisely identify stringy degrees of freedom in the CFT. Um, if if uh, me and Ben were talking about this uh, quite a bit, um, I know there's this uh, Gavin Orion work, which I think they, they're able to do that in some limit, uh, the PP wave limit, which I, I don't know in detail, so I don't want to say too much about it, but um, I think actually, uh, and there they were able to sort of identify like what are the what are the stringy modes in the CFT because I guess in principle everything should be in the CFT somewhere. It's just uh, it's just a matter of what's the combination of operators. But but the things that we we're looking at here are kind of the simplest, you know, the simplest thing that the naivest thing that one uh, could think of. Um, and so uh, the the fact that you, this this seems very likely that you do get this growth term uh, with these bosonic modes. It actually it actually sort of led to discussions about um, uh, revisiting the the string pro the string computation in the superstructure geometry. And that's what uh, me, along with in collaboration with Nate's and uh, Yushuan, uh, what appeared today. We uh, we we went back and looked at that problem. And so just a, a slide or two on, on that is we considered. Now you need to actually consider the full 10D metric, um, the full 10D string metric, um, because uh, we considered another direction, this theta equals pi upon two. And actually, um, in, in that case, you, you get this uh, conformal factor that's a function of, of V and phi one. And so because of that, you actually find some interesting behavior that, that the, the uh, so the free factor in front of the torus directions actually uh, obtain sort of uh, some tidal force behavior. And so um, when you, uh, and uh, we have this, uh, this nice picture, <laughs> courtesy of Nate's, um, of, uh, of what we actually computed. And we, so we considered an infalling probe again. Um, and we haven't actually done the string calculus. We haven't looked at the string equations of motion yet, but what we, what we did find was that this sort of mass matrix term that would enter into the string equations of motion, it, it, it actually um, has this oscillatory behavior um, and, and along uh, the torus directions and, and also along uh, one of the other directions as well. And so basically when it goes negative, this is like a negative sort of mass squared. So uh, this is sort of the, the, the string uh, being stretched and sort of oscillates between the two. Um, between positive and negative values. And so uh, the, main, the main result is that it, it's, it, it, we were able to show that there, you do seem to have tidal ex excitations in the torus directions. And uh, it doesn't, typically the torus just kind of comes along for the ride, but it's interesting to see that you actually get this behavior. And, and, but, but we still need to do more analysis on the string equations of motion on the B field. We didn't include, include the B field, we didn't include, um, we need to go back and compute sort of the tidal tensor. It's another way of computing this. Um, there's several things that we like to do, but, um, and so- can you, can you just back up a second, John? Yes, the, yes. the amplitude of that oscillation, is it the same scale as the kind of amplitudes that Emil and I found, or is it suppressed, large, larger, or is it, there's some uh, powers of B and A that are in front of that. Yeah, um, I think, well, it, these, I think it's the same order of as the uh, as the tidal tensor along the phi direction in this computation. Um, 
I'm not sure how it compares with uh, with you and Emil's. I don't know if anyone maybe has uh, any more comment on that. Um, I can't. So, so the amplitude scale would be squared over a to the power of four. So I think they're similar to what you've done. Uh -huh. So as B goes larger, uh, they, they become large as well. So with the long throat, you have significant tidal effects. And these, is, these are all in all um, similar in all directions. So it's not that the tidal forces along the T4 are much smaller than compared to tidal forces along, for example, the Y direction, but they're comparable in size. And how many positive? Oh, they're oscillating because in my life, I'm one positive eigenvalue and one negative eigenvalue, mm -hmm. essentially. You've got a oscill six oscillating eigenvalues, I guess. Or six or eight. I think. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. It's seven, I think, right? Um, so it's, um, sorry, it's eight, and uh, all of them are um, going from uh, positive to negative, except uh, the, um, the one that the, um, on, uh, on the y direction. Yeah, the y direction stays positive. So, so, it gets, so it gets squished in the y direction, but otherwise it's been... Okay. Yeah. yeah, and uh, so the tidal force um, along the T4 is very, very similar to the tidal force along the S3 directions. Mm. Well, so Sorry, is it, is it oscillating or is it just rotating? How many oscillations are there between the, the top of the... Throat in the cap. It's something that that scales with uh, with n, uh, n being the, uh, the the mode number of the superstratum. What's happening here, Emil, is uh, is that the amplitude in front of the torus now depends on the cosine n phi. Um, so, uh, so okay. it, it, and so it's encountering radial, you know. It's encountering derivatives of those factors, and therefore, if n is larger, I think there are more wiggles. Is that correct, guys? Yeah, yeah. So um, the um, the oscillations come mainly from um, from the motion along y, uh, and so we probe the um, the fact that um, along y there is a um, z over two n um, symmetry about the, uh, the the strings frame. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, what we looked at was uh, uh, we, we were trying to understand tidal forces um, in the CFT, and uh, this looks what we found maybe it looks like the it looks like it could be the the effect this growth, um, and the way we 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 compare it, what we we. We compared the process of just a probe falling in to a, a uh, to an ADS, and then a probe falling in to a superstrata. We compared those two processes in the CFT, and we found some differences in the amplitude. And that's where we found this uh, t squared growth. Um, and this, you know, as I said, this is suggestive uh, of, of these tidal excitations. And and we considered that the similar process could happen along T four, and uh, we, we indeed show uh, in, in the gravity computation that there is a, a special set of geodesics which give us these uh, tidal excitations. Um, we, so we want to compute this, so the corresponding amplitude in the CFT, though it's expected that it will give sort of a similar thing. But um, more, uh, I guess I really want to understand more of how to identify stringy modes in the CFT. Um, like a per, precisely what they are, and I think that's I don't I, I don't think that's I think that's maybe not so worked out. Like I said, I think there's this one this situation with the Gavin Orion uh, where they looked at it, but I think in general it may uh, it's not well understood as far as I understand. And we'd like to consider maybe a long consider a long winding sector uh, that may help address uh, some, uh, some of what Masaki was asking. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, that's all I have. Uh, uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, hopefully that made some sense. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, so I have some questions and so, I have a, 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 a bit more time. Uh, 
There are some things in the chat, which I don't know if they have been. Yeah, Emil was raising a point. Do you want to say more about that, Emil? And oh, about um, that? well, this question about, about uh, what's stringy and what's not. I mean, um, the, oh, sorry. if you're working in the symmetric product, you're at, you're at a place in the moduli space where the string scale is the same as the ADS scale. And so to a first approximation, everything is stringy. <laughs> Um, in other words, the, I mean, the ADS scale is the string scale. Then basically anytime you excite anything, awesome. you're in the soup of string oscillator modes. Mm. So, so the more pertinent question is when is something not stringy? <laughs> you know, when is it reliably sort of quote, not stringy? And that's when it's BPS. So, okay. um, okay. So, cause, I, cause the alpha, so for example, if you had a probe, um, that's you know a graviton. It's just you have you can start with an alpha minus one, and you can apply the rigid generators, and you can just boost it. And so that corresponds. Yeah, that's a particle moving with linear momentum. But somehow this sp so this splitting behavior is is sort of signaling maybe like the stringy modes, like you're saying, acquiring some type of rest mass, I guess. Um, yeah. So um, I mean, it was just a few. Yeah. Well, something getting stringy. Um, yeah. Any any anytime you start just you know piling some random oscillators on on the ground state, I think I think you're just moving into the the stringy regime. Mm -hmm. um, I see. I see. Can Let's, I just okay. echo what Emil just said? Uh, I think what Emil is saying is exactly. On the dot, you can first look at what are the BPS states, and you know the BPS states in supergravity are only a 256 dimensional multiplicator. We know them all, and roughly speaking, anything with one left and one right mover at the orbifold point is a supergravity particle. And once you start piling up more things like you know three left and three right, what are you doing, or even two left and two right, it's basically going to be stringy, unless it's the special combination which end up ended up becoming you know, L minus one on the guy or something, you know, because mm -hmm. then that is mm -hmm. just a, a motion on it. So unless you're doing something very simple, like a global charge acting on a one left, one right mover, uh, it's going to be stringy. So the entire uh, 256 dimensional massless multiplet of supergravity is, is half of it is in the singly wound sector and half of it is in the doubly wound sector. The singly wound sector has one left and one right mover. The doubly wound sector has one twist and I actually forget what are the exact excitations. But basically, everything is covered by that. So mm -hmm. okay. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. and anything else is basically going to be almost certainly stringy. And once you go to larger windings, then Gavandaran gives you the exact answer anyway, in, the, in that limit. Right, right, right. Yeah. So now, for those of us who are not so expert, does that mean that this, pro this is or is not a, a signal of some tidal force? You, you're asking me? Yeah. OK, so I know much less about that. I mean, I don't. Certainly, I think this is showing that a single string has gone to stringy things. Uh, and if there was no tidal force, it wouldn't go to stringy things because a BPS particle would continue as BPS, right? Because it's right. just, if you just put an ADS space, it's just a geodesic, so it just goes to the other side. So I think it's clear the guy has gone to something stringy. But uh, so I guess I think it's fine to call a tidal force because if you, what else would make something go from a non-stringy to a stringy, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah. I, mean, the, so I, I got a historical footnote to this because Joseph and I, based on animals and my calculation, we're going to Sean and say, look, there's gotta be something special about the polarization in the space time because Emma and I only found two eigenvalues so, and, and it grows in the space time. And Sean started doing these calculations, trying to see the difference. And he said, well, there's complete democracy, roughly speaking, between whether it's on the torus or not. And then they went away and found that Emil and I, of course, had picked a very special geodesic we could analyze, and a generic geodesic sees tidal forces in all directions. So it struck me as kind of indicative that we really are seeing some transition here to stringiness. And you know, the, the footnote is that we were telling Sean he should only see something in uh, in the, in the spatial directions and not in the torus directions. And he, you know, the conform field theory told him something other. And so it's kind of nice that that feedback worked. And then they went and found it in the gravity side that the, tor the tidal forces are big in every direction. 
Yeah, that's very nice. I just have one always a background worry in my mind, which I have never completely been able to resolve. So let me just mention that. Like at the orbifold point, we know that the graviton is, let's say, one left and one right mover, right? So HIJ is del XI del bar XJ. Once you go off the orbifold point, the question is, do you also have to correct the operator? Like the evolution is we are putting in by the twist operator. That's as time evolves, the twists are keeping on changing the state. But the operator graviton itself also will be not just one left and one right, but a combination of one left, one right, three left, three right, and so on. Right? So how would I know that I actually started with the graviton or I actually started with a combination of a graviton and a string and I'm just seeing the oscillations between them. Now, of course, if he's seeing secular growth like he's seeing now, like he's keeping on increasing, that looks like a signal of, sec of you know, real change. Mm -hmm. But I just don't know at what order one has to worry about the initial state oh, when you say I'm throwing in a graviton. At leading order to orbifold point, of course, it is one left and one right. But once you are working at second order in perturbation theory, you always have to be careful whether the graviton itself had to be corrected. Now, for the lifting calculations, we had all this long calculation to show that, okay, up to second order, we don't have to look at the perturbation of the state. We can only look at, so that, but there's a whole calculation to check that. For general non-BPS state evolution, I mean, that was a BPS state lifting, right? But for non-BPS mm -hmm. state evolution, I never figured that out. So I don't actually know what is the right way to think of the graviton state inputted down the throat uh, in the beginning. Mm. How much of a three, three left, three right mixture it should have. But so somehow one should also compute the eigenstates without any evolution with both left and right excited. That's not the kind of lifting we'll be doing with bin, right? Because there's only left excitations. One should compute the actual eigenstates with both left and right to see what is actually a graviton at, uh, you know, graviton has both left and right. Not, so what is actually a graviton at, let's say, second order in perturbation theory? Mm. And then that's the guy that should be put in. And there's just a tiny bit of worry you always have that one is putting in something which is already a linear combination of a graviton and strings because the actual eigenstates are all mixed up. Uh, and then it's not clear what one whether one is seeing evolution or just the fact that one put in something which was stringy. But it's a very general question. So isn't that a subleading correction though, in the sense of the fact that he's got a T squared growth in the state into what seems to be just a mess of strings? Absolutely. I think it's the T square which convinces me this might be real because if it was really a you put in a mixture of two eigenstates, it'll oscillate, right? So the secular yeah. growth is seen. I think that suggests to me this is not purely an effect of not having the correct initial operator. But in any case, it might be nice to com compute the actual graviton operator to second order in perturbation theory, so that we know that we are not actually, at least we can filter out that effect. And um, yeah. should there be some, some um, one over n suppression of these sort of effects you're talking about? Or is that, uh, is this already at order sort of end of the zero, you expect these sort of corrections? You're asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. Uh, yeah, I think everything should be one by n suppressed because if n is big, then the ADS is big and the tidal effects are small, right? So nothing will change if you put it in a very big ADS, I suppose. But here he's working with n equals two, right? I mean, he's not even using anything else. Yes, n equals two. Uh, there are, I mean, you, you can you can have some enhancement factor if, if you all if you keep them singly wound. Uh, if you have n zero zero, you can twist like you you can twist the first two guys or but but you could also twist the first and the third if if you go back to the same string. Um, I think you get right. some enhancement. That will be one by n effect. Right? If there are many strings, then you might end up twisting one of the blank ones, and nothing will happen. That kind of is that what you were saying, Emil? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, on the gravity side, I guess it just means, I think that's what you're saying, right? If the ADS is very big, almost nothing will be tidally excited because it's, I mean, it's more hard to tidally excite something because you're moving in a local, locally flat space. Mm. What will happen if you actually start not with singly wound things, but you start with things which were K times wound? Would you expect a one over K suppression or would you expect some... Sean, do you have any thoughts? On that uh, I would, I would want to say one, uh, one over k suppression, but um, because let's see, 
basically if you if you were to do something like that you could basically you could just rescale everything by k yeah. and, and so the l minus ones if everything was equally wound you could the l minus ones j minus ones will go to l minus k j minus k acting on like a singly wound guy if you had if they were all equal um so if you rescale everything by k i'm trying to see if that gives a factor of k on top or bottom uh yes but also the bose suppression sorry bose enhancement will be down because it'll be n zero over k and things like that so i right, think there's a, whole right. there's a whole bunch of k factors that might be interesting to see where they finally wind up yeah the the the, the thing once you uh, the, the, the nice thing about the singly wound sector is that the l minus j actually turns into something very simple it turns into a d L minus J acting on the zero zero guy, it, it gives you a D minus N. But if it's L minus two or L minus anything greater than L minus one, it begins to pile up. Um, <laughs> and so if there was a way, uh, if, if there was a way to do that, it would be interesting. Uh, it's, uh, I think I'd started, I think we, we started trying to look at that, but it just got so, uh, so complicated. Maybe there's a way, maybe there's a way though. Um, yeah, I have to think about it. I think we can also do that. Uh, Samir was talking about the graviton, uh, the second order for the graviton. Um, were you thinking like uh, like an alpha alpha bar and then apply two Ds to the alpha alpha bar and then have an alpha alpha bar in the final state? And that's going to tell you something about the correction. Is that kind of what you had in mind, Samir? Yeah, so that's the amount of lifting, but then you can also find those eigenstates, right? So you would actually get uh -huh. a mixing matrix. So you start with one, one on the left and let's say three, three on the right, but even that will have a non-zero amplitude. So you have a matrix, right? One uh -huh. left, one right going to one left, one right, one left, one right going to three left, right? So you have a matrix and you diagonalize right. that only then you get the actual eigenstates and the actual eigenvalues. So if you actually want to input a graviton, you have to first input an eigenstate of the problem. Right. And the eigenstate at the orbifold point is, of course, not the eigenstate at a generic point. Now, of course, any effect from there would probably be oscillatory. So I think it would, wouldn't would interfere with your secular effects, but the oscillatory part might be corrected. I see. Hmm. I see. I'm just thinking maybe we could probably do that in some, maybe some simple case. Now, also, what Nick was saying about the K winding thing, I think that's good because if you could go to that domain, I don't know if that's doable. But if you have K, let's say large, let's say a big number, but the capital N is even bigger, right? So uh, you have lots of empty strings. Mm -hmm. That's the limit of Gavanarayan. So in that limit, whatever you do with gravity is completely trustworthy. Uh, it's okay. not like the orbifold point is different from the gravity point. So you don't know what is happening. The whole point of Gavanarayan was that in that limit, you do know what is happening because it's a controlled approximation of ADS CFT. Right. right. Oh yeah, that would be, yeah, you'd have a good hold on all the state. Yeah. Mm. So I guess there's one, one other comment to make here, a couple of comments to make. One is that um, this is this uh, old work of uh, Samir and um, I forget who else, um, maybe Oleg, uh, where you were looking at uh, these um, sort of gravitational shock waves, um, you know, sort of asking what is the dual of a long string in, right. in, in this formalism. And it's basically, where everybody is a is a is everybody's a short strand, except you have one um, uh, object which uh, one strand which is long. Yes. And so I was wondering where that so 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 presumably some feature of tidal stretching would be a sewing together of the plus plus strands. Mm. Yeah. into a longer plus plus strand um creating this sort of you know shockwave like object um that that would be something which is is making sort of a longer string mm -hmm. uh, um uh which is sort of what you expect right you you you're making a longer strand and then oscillator excitations on that longer strand um are, are easier to excite and that would be the indication that you have a 
turned a sort of a graviton into a longer string, oh. um, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's true or not. That that I have to think about that because that's mucking with the angular momentum of the system. Um, but but anyway, um, so but so that that's a, a question of of uh, you know the things one has to play with one also has the ability to play with uh uh you know cr creating longer strands mm -hmm. and and that's another way things can go stringy right um, right so i mean just to yeah. understand what you said because that sounds very interesting if you just take all short strands and one long strand then on the gravity dual side the one long strand act like some kind of defect or shock wave sitting in the ads so if you throw something in it will interact with that defect instead of just floating, you know, in a geodesic through ADS. And when it hits that defect, it can get excited. So I think what you're saying is if all are short strings, but one is a long string, and now if you excite one of the short strings, so it's like throwing something in, when you actually twist that excited short string with this long string, that's the effect of interacting with the shock wave defect. That's what you're saying, right? Um, that sounds... oh, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm 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 worried. I'm saying something that's not uh, conserving angular momentum. Um, but uh, yeah, what what I'm what I'm saying may be maybe not so sensible. But um, no, I think that makes uh, sense. Right? I don't know what what's the angular momentum worry you have. I mean, angular momentum will change if you make. Well, I'm just for a long I'm, month. I'm just thinking of. Uh, um, uh, there's not so much difference between a gravitational shock wave um, uh, now I, I probably need to think offline about this for a bit um, it, 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 would you if you twist it to for example uh some of the angular momentum, uh, are you saying maybe it would go, you're worried that it might go into, some of the angular momentum from the geometry might go into the particle? Is that? Well, so, yeah, so one way I could conserve angular momentum, I suppose, is uh, uh, indeed if, if, if I'm trying to wind up to uh, wind up a longer string. So, so this, this is the kind of thing that maybe sounds a little bit more like what Nick and I were, were doing, that, that, um, if you take a bunch of plus plus strands of length one mm -hmm. and you, you wind them all together uh, to make a single strand of some longer length, um, th then you need to put the plus plus somewhere because the right. plus plus carries some angular momentum. Yeah, yeah. But you could say, okay, I can, I can account for that by having the excitations be fermions, as you were saying. Mm. So, so that would begin to sound like, okay, I'm, I'm making kind of a longer strand, which is a, a more stringy thing, and it's got some fermion excitation, so the stretching is along the S3. Mm. So, so that might be some, something of, of the sort w of what uh, Nick and I originally discovered, which, which, was, which was that the tidal stretching was along the S3. Mm. Uh, that, that, but that's just, you know, right now it's just bullshit. Um, the other comment that I had was a, more of a question. Um, so you're finding this, this um, oscillating tidal force that goes between stretching and compression. Mm -hmm. And I guess my, uh, it's, just, it's just a question is, is if I'm undergoing rapid cycling between stretching and compression until the string actually decoheres, uh, does it just shrink back to where it was to begin with? If I, if I, if I give it equal amounts of stretching and compression, it'll just, you know, it'll stretch, but then it'll just shrink back to where it was. So until the oscillators that I excite during the stretching sort of actually decohere, um, I could worry that all I'm doing is sort of reversing the stretching that I did to begin with and compress it back to a small string. 
Mm. There might still be some secular growth because as, as you run down the throat, the the amount of stretching and compression is 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 presumably varying. Um, but you might not grow as much as you thought you did because of this alternating back and forth between stretching and compression. Mm, yeah, I see what you're saying. I guess this would, I guess this would be a question of like time time scales. Um, is is the 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 geometry or the tidal force? Is it um, is it acting faster or slower than I guess the string uh, than sort of the modes on the string? You see what I'm trying to? Let me see. Well, the, the, so the, the calculation that you do on the string is basically um, uh, some sort of a bulk, you're cal calculating some Bogolyubov coefficients for the various string oscillator modes. And so, you know, what's happening during the tidal uh, uh, disruption is you start with the vacuum state, right? The string enters the throat mm -hmm. uh, where all the oscillators are in their ground state. Okay. And then it's just some standard, um, uh, you know, uh, in out calculation in the, in the, the QFT of the modes on the string. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what is the Bogolyubov transformation you're doing? It's basically you're constructing a squeeze state mm -hmm. of the, of each mode on the string. And, and, um, you know, if there, if you're, there's just stretching, okay, then the squeezed state has a high oscillator excitation and you just read off at, at, at the end, you know, how many oscillators you've excited. Um, but if, if you're going to sort of unsqueeze it by applying a, um, you know, a, an inverse squeezing transformation, mm -hmm. you know, you can think of this sort of oscillation cycle that you're going through. Um, let me turn on my video so I can wave my hands. Uh, <laughs> the, the, um, so, you know, so the, the, you're undergoing some stretching excitation. So that's, you know, um, a, a squeezing transformation of each oscillator mode in some particular way. If, if during the compression, you're just executing the inverse of that squeezing transformation, then you may undo a lot of the effect that, that, that you did with the stretching trans, uh, transformation. Isn't um, there also a question here of resonance? You know, if the string's natural oscillation frequency is the, the same as the oscillation of the bumps you're running through, then some of those are going to get enhanced like crazy. Yeah, the, the, my worry is that you just undo it. Um, well, I can imagine that if the squeezing is much fast compared to the natural oscillation of the string, then it all averages out. Or if it's slow relative to the natural oscillations of the string, then indeed you stretch it a bit and you squeeze it a bit. And you... Well, the, the, the oh, modes that resonates. go on stable are, are always ones where, where you're running down the throat faster than uh, the natural uh, frequency of yeah. that particular mode. True. Sure. Okay. Uh, once you excite it, well, once you're excited, this compre compressing it de excited. I mean, when, it's like that's well, it's that's a question. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, okay. Because yeah, basically, I'm, what what you're doing is you're uh, all these these um, Bogolyubov transformations for harmonic oscillators are basically just applying a standard um, uh, squeezing transformation of a harmonic oscillator, right? What's a squeezing transformation? It's basically start with sort of a uh, 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 you know, crude, crude way of thinking about it is that if the ground state of the harmonic oscillator is sort of a disk in phase space of size h bar, um, then um, mm. you turn it into an ellipse by a squeezing transformation. That's basically the Bogo above transformation. And so if you look at it sort of along the x axis, it looks like, oh, it's been excited, but really it's, it's still occupying the same ellipse in phase space. Uh, of size h bar, you've just distorted it. Right. So I could worry that during the next phase of the uh, down the throat where you're uh, undergoing a compression, you just turn it back into a round disc in phase space. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, so you undergo some sequence of those things as you run down the throat. Uh, you could worry that you, in, in the end of the day, haven't excited the thing much at all. Um, oh, I, whereas I, for, the, for the thing that that uh, you know, Nick and I looked at where the whole period going down the throat, there was this one mode which was unstable. You're definitely stretching it in that direction. 
And that direction was some uh, linear combination of the um, one of the five, one of the Euler angles and, uh, mm -hmm. and the Y direction. So mm -hmm. the string definitely got stretched along that one axis. It didn't get recompressed. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, if I think about a harmonic oscillator, if I change it quickly and change it back, it's pretty much still in this ground state. Is that the, is that kind of, kind of think of it in a simple toy model like that? It's yeah, that's, fast, that's yes. the intuition. Yeah. Uh, okay. is, the, is the time of this, is, is the time of this oscillation short or long compared to the string oscillation mode? That's what I'm trying to. Well, this yeah. was the thing I was asking about earlier. So you, you were telling me that it's just the cosine N phi of the of I the super. I think so, profile. but remember it's boosted like crazy. So it's seen in a in a highly ultra relativistic frame. So it's a good question. Yeah. All this tells me is we had it easy, I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we still. The, the other thing that also might be relevant, let me just chuck this into the mix, is we also got to ignore the B field rotating this thing at Lorentz rotating the string. It may yeah. be that the B field then rotates this and, and uh, enables you to build the oscillation in a different direction. It, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we, we thought about those effects, but they were subleading for us. Yeah, but they may not have yeah, been subleading. Be maybe it's time to uh, yes, yeah, maybe this is too much again and you know, take a quick break <laughs> before the next talk so let's thank sean again thank you sean that was great <laughs>